uh, Sebastian Boemi. So, in fact, their timing screens have got out of place. They're now showing McNish leading him. No, I'm. No. Uh, yeah, no, we've. Uh, yeah, everything. Uh, not quite right there. No, I think but it, it looks. There's a glitch there, isn't there? But it's definitely this car in the lead because, as we say, the Audi's behind him. So and through right. turn one, that is Buemi, who's been the fastest driver, closely followed by Stefan Sarazan. The, the difficulty is, Anthony Davis has said, three drivers. There's always going to be a winner and a loser over a six-hour period in terms of track time. Anthony was allotted the Friday. It was a complete washout, believe it or not, here in Austin, Texas. So he hasn't had the laps. And I spoke to Oli Jarvis about this before the weekend. Ideally, you would only want two drivers. OK, when you come to Texas, the heat and the physicality of the place means that three drivers is a bonus in the race. But in terms of track time, a driver always wants more track time. You know, we are bred that way, and uh, they'll bemoan the fact that they haven't got as much track time as everyone <laughs> else until the weekend's yeah. over. And, and that's been the case for Anthony Davidson. He hasn't quite been as quick as Buemi, as we're going to have a look at some highlights. Well, we thought we were, but we're back with Buemi at the moment. Uh, and Buemi, incidentally, the reason we had confusion there, he was just coming out of the pits. That's why, while we were in the break, we didn't see it. And he has made his sixth pit stop, which is why he's just fallen back behind Alan McNish. So uh, there we go. Yeah, we missed it. And yeah, that's why. Second in class. So, so in fact, he is 30 seconds behind Alan McNish, not the other way around, as it was just before the pit stop. So I think that's what the catch up was. There. Yeah. We didn't get counted in on that. So can't be sure. But what we are sure is that this car is now leading. Yeah, and he. He is uh, one ahead. So Alan McNish really, really pushing. They both are. I mean, Boemi's been looking so quick, hasn't he? The last couple of laps. That's why they're running 150s, both of them at the moment. And uh, down the hill comes uh, Alan. The 32 car cuts across his bow. And that's a car, of course, with uh, Jan Cherouz on board that ran into the back of Stefan Sarazan here yesterday. Now we've got the highlights coming up. Now we've got them. <laughs> Right, here we go. Let's go back to the start then. 28 cars on the grid, Audi, Audi and Toyota. And uh, Toyota doing it all it can to use its uh, instantly available hybrid power, but can't quite do it, even though he goes a long way round. Behind them, James Rosser to get spat out the pack. Had a collision with the Pecom car, breaks the suspension, and that car will go absolutely no further. It was a real heartbreak for that crew. Now we're on board with Fazler. He goes flying over one of the sausage curves. Watch this as he goes up the inside of one of the Porsches. Didn't make it stick. And that was the beginning of his troubles. This is one of the factory Porsches catching fire. It was actually after the refueling stop, a spark off the tire change meant that the car literally went up in flames. Then it was Buemi. Oh, no, this was Christensen passing Sarazan, wasn't it? Yep, Sar later on. Sarazan giving him plenty of room, then tucking in behind and just sitting there. Just follow the Audi, get a nice toe, keep all the temperatures right. Christensen comes into handover and Sarazan goes into the lead. That's Loic Deval now jumping in to this car. Pretty much been the pace, qualified that Audi, and he was really about to break the hearts of the Toyota garage because it was this stint that really did separate uh, the lead between the number two Audi and that number eight Toyota. But they've always been on the same lap, of course, so nothing's changed there. We're just looking at the top speed, 289. And look at the way that uh, du Duval is trying to get past this uh, Number eight, Toyota, doing everything he can. Eventually he does it, and again, Sarazan, who's still on board, triple stinting, gives him room and then tucks him behind again. Because he was about 35 seconds behind the Toyota, wasn't it? Wasn't he? And, and we really, at this stage, were wondering how, as were the Toyota crew, were the Toyota still in the mix? He <laughs> was still in the mix. Yeah, and such as. Anthony Davison takes over, but he will only do one stint because, by his own confession, hasn't had enough time in the car. So the decision is taken by Toyota High Command to put Sebastian Boemi back in the car to the end of the race. And 
that's the difference between the two. It really was that stint where Loic Duval caught Sarazan. Davidson was slow. It took him 10 laps by his own admission to get up to speed. And Loic Duval going very, very quickly in that Audi. Then that was Trelia in the sister car. And it's been the number one that's permanently been in the walls. Yeah. Locking the rears into turn 12. And then they were to st uh, a stop and go, well, a drive-through penalty. For not for respecting track, track limits. limits. Yeah. Olivier Pla, suspension damage. Was that due to the incident between the two Oak Racing teammates? We'll have to wait and see. But he had a lengthy pit stop to uh, fix that. I don't know if they're back out yet, yeah. but we, they are back out, aren't they? And this is the last pit stop. Well, the last pit stop we saw for the uh, Toyota team, Sebastian Buemi taking over again, as we say, and he'll be double stinting his tyres. We're now back to real time. Here's our race leader, Alan McNish, and he has 29.8 seconds over Buemi. Buemi has already cut that down by one second while we were showing you the highlights. So, interview with Loic Duval, and for me, he's been a real star of this race. And really led from the front. Like it's certainly in been that a close car. battle. Can Alan keep that lead? And more importantly, can those tyres hold out? I mean, we are trying. Uh, Alan is doing his best now, and uh, I think we can make it. You know, I mean, we was di quite difficult at the beginning of the race, but uh, then we carry on. Now the speed looks uh, looks pretty good. Uh, it's going to be a nice fight, which is uh, which is great for everybody. But uh, we 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 do have our chance. So finger crossed for the moment. Thank you. So Loic Duval being quite cagey on his chances. Doesn't want to put the jinx on their effort, does he? Yeah, I remember he's dealing, he's driving with the, the, this Masters of uh, Le Mans, this Tom Christensen, nine wins, Alan McNish, three wins. That was Loic's first win uh, this year, driving of those two. He's from Chartres, which is within shouting distance of, uh, of the Le Mans circuit, and he would just love to be champion this year. That's where he's heading for. We say that it's one of the outstanding drives, but Again, Stefan Sarazan, triple stinting. And don't forget Alex Brundle, triple stinting and making his set of Dunlops last for that triple stint. How good was that? Oh, there's been some real standout performances throughout the field. I mean, as you mentioned, Sarazan, Buemi, then Loic Duval, and uh, the likes of Brundle really trusted with the reins of that Oat racing car, triple stinted in this heat is testimony to his pace and fitness. And then all the way down the field, the Ferrari drivers, the Aston Martin drivers. It's been a real joy to watch. Plenty of talent on show. Some really, really good and respectful driving. And we've had the odd incident, haven't we? The circuit lends itself to that with the layout. We heard Darren well, Turner bemoaning. And there it is. Look at that. Isn't that a great sort of track? Curves. Yeah, it, it was beautiful. Yeah, just as we're going into uh, late afternoon, it's 10 past four here in Texas, and the shadows are starting to lengthen already. A very sharp contrast. But again, Tom causing problems for drivers because certain parts of the circuit are coming over brows straight into the sun. Exactly, and you've got to have your wits about you, and uh, the further through the corner you look, the better. Now that is the 45 car facing the wrong direction. Yeah, that's the Oak Racing car, the, the multicoloured one, which... Uh, Maurice on board, Eric yeah, Maurice. Yeah, on Maurice. Car Jack Nicolet also drives, and... Uh, Beautiful livery. Yep, that's the art car from Le Mans this year. Here we are. Oh, it's just a... Well, that's an unusual place to go off, isn't it? Yeah, he's just lost the rear end. Uh, yeah, just tap the barriers of the front, hopefully not too much damage, but he can't restart the car. Now, this would play into Toyota's hands if we get a safety car, wouldn't it? Because oh. that gap would disappear between uh, McNish and uh, Buemi, provided the safety car picks up them as first and second. They'll no no safe, wave by here. They'll be doing a safety car dance right now. Yeah, yeah, so... What's happening down at that corner? Which turn was that that he, he went off at? That was at? near the end of the lap. Yep. So yep. I think it was 17. 17, 18, one of those, yeah. Just a very strange place to go off there. Gently nosing it into the barriers. Well, where it, no, it's actually, you tell you what, it's near uh, the end of the first sector. Right. Looking at that track layout, so it is near the beginning of the lap, so... Um, 
it, it's in a dangerous place. The very fact that he's gone off proves that it's capable of uh, happening to anybody, and he's not um, too far away from the edge of the track. Has he got that running? Because it did look as though he's pointing a bit more in the direction that he wanted to go in. <laughs> but I tell you what, sitting facing the wrong direction, watching the time ebb away is a driver's worst nightmare. Oh, yeah. Just imagine what is going on in the garage as the mechanics grimace and you can see all of their hard work and frustration uh, painted in the imagination as you just see <laughs> you ju it's just the worst feeling you almost it's the it's the one place you don't want to return to the pit garage because you just feel so indebted to everybody yep. in and around the team but if it's a good team they'll understand that you win and lose together and that is teamwork mike conway then in the 26 car still leading lmp2 and they're leading that uh, by i think a lap now aren't they uh, over pierre kaffer and tor graves Still a Reiko Nissan 1, 2, 3, then it's Lotus in fourth place. And what a result this would be for the 32 Lotus of Jan Charouz. And talking of that car, John Martin is about to be interviewed. Good. Over to you, Louise. He started this car. Mike went out on new tyres and you're debating what you're going to do for that last pit stop. Yeah, I mean, we got enough of a lead. I think it's a uh, minute 34 or something over the PCOM car, so we got a bit of time in hand to sort of play it safe, maybe put a new set on, but um, I think the, the way the circuit's ru really rubbering in, you could probably easily do a double stint, so um, yeah, we'll see what happens, really. Thank you. I definitely think you'll be able to do a double stint on those Dunlop tyres. And I think somebody of Mike Conway's experience, his pace, uh, certainly somebody who really knows the American way of racing, and may or may not have track experience well, here. Surely Alan Docking's got someone down at Oak, been just watching what they do, and they've seen Alex Brundle triple stint set at the same tyres, so... Uh... They'll work it out. They'll understand the time loss of changing tyres and they'll look at their lap time, their retrospective lap time compared to those around them and, and work it out. It'll be a fairly straight forward decision for them. We're going to go for a commercial break. Join us in a moment. If you're just joining us on Eurosport, you have missed a lot. We're now in the final 45 minutes of the six hours at Cota. Circuit of the Americas, the all-new Formula One track at Austin, Texas. 5.5 kilometers of driver heaven really is Tom Gamer. I mean, I think anyone driving here this weekend will come away thinking, wow. I mean, exactly that. You can have cow sheds lining the exterior of the track because as far as the drivers are concerned, it is just the most unbelievable layout. Um, just to drive this track is sheer joy. This is the third place car with Marcel Fazler still aboard that. But everybody that drives this track has not got a negative thing to say about it. It's got that Silverstone effect to it. It's fast and flowing. The first uh, and the beginning of the second sector is just absolutely magical. It's but one corner flowing into a, another. It's a snake meandering yeah. around, and you're just chasing the throttle, trying to build your minimum speed up lap by lap as you learn the place. Yeah, really but then on good. top of that, I mean, the infrastructure is amazing. $400 million sports complex here. It's very close to the city of Austin, and they have been so welcoming the Texans. They've put on shows in the city centre. They've had the cars there. They've had rodeos. They've had the cowgirls here. Everything you could want. Bruno Senna, a man from Brazil. Let's hear what he's got to say. It's a show in America, isn't it? And they do an absolute great job of delivering a sporting event. Really watching those timing screens at the moment. It's not been a bad one so far. Yeah, it's um, very close between us and the Ferrari. Um, unfortunately, I had a tired laminate and uh, missed a few laps on my stint, and uh, that can put us in a tough situation. But Fred has been doing a great job. He's been very, very quick, and uh, so hopefully we're going to be quick enough to stay ahead of the Ferrari. But, uh, yeah, very anxious time for us and we need to make sure that we keep on uh, pushing hard. Thank you. So Bruno Senna who 
has in the last couple of years become a really great ambassador for Brazilian motorsport, just as his uncle was. But uh, Bruno does it with out any arrogance of any sort, no sense of uh, the fame of his family. He's just such a nice guy and he's just so good for Brazilian racing. The Brazilians beautiful race and uh, I've had Brazilian teammates and they're always uh, just fun loving people. I, I remember I had a, a teammate and I always said that if he was any more relaxed, he'd be lying down, he'd be horizontal. <laughs> And uh, they stick together as well, the Brazilians. They've come to Europe and they all know each other. And Bruno Senna, as you said, comes from such a famous heritage of, uh, you know, motorsporting history. And he takes it in his stride. He's, he's, he's a great guy. He's his own man as well. And that's what I like about him. You know, he's not trying to emulate anybody else. He's Bruno Senna and... and uh, and he concentrates on himself. Yeah, I it's like got time for everyone. I like you're so relaxed to be lying down. I, I had a sticker on my road car when I was racing Formula Ford that said, Formula Ford drivers only do it lying down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Absolutely. here we are. Got a bit of a traffic jam here in the pits. Now, I think this is Darren Turner's car, isn't it, that was uh, pushed away. Are they going to get out just for the last last bit of the laps? Just. Um, yeah, <laughs> just test, testing that the front split is going to break off if you jump on it enough. Well, the damper's gone through the strut, hasn't yeah. it? That, that's the problem. Uh, yeah. so it they're, is. they're just checking that it, it it still works, and that is the technical guys at uh, WEC talking to yeah. David Richards, I think. I yeah. saw in the background there. I the think boss. What, what we have to bear in mind is these cars are not coming home. They are next. They'll be loaded onto ships, and they'll be heading for Fuji in Japan, probably going via Pearl Harbor on the way, but... Uh, <laughs> Exactly. Hawaii, Hawaii. But uh, so maybe, yes, as you say, David Rich was back to us there, the uh, owner of Aston Martin and the FI Tech guys just uh, having a look. They're presumably asking, you know, is this car going to be passed if we take it to Fuji like this? Or Is it safe? Is there damage to the chassis where the, yeah. where the strut insert is? I, I don't know. They, they were demonstrating that the damper is working, that the spring is working. Uh, yes. He's having a good look here, and Dave Richards over his shoulder. Yeah, you can see where the strut had cracked the uh, top of the front wing, can't you, where it bumped through. I mean, it was such a thump, but, I mean, so was that for Marcel Fastler. You know, both those cars were three wheel uh, one-wheelers for a moment as they came down. Such a big, big impact. Yeah, and if you get it ever so slightly wrong, that's what happens. I mean, looking at Olivier Pla, he's back out after their lengthy pit stop. He had a, a right rear suspension failure. His car in the wars with uh, Heinemann Hansen behind the wheel. It was his teammate, uh, Ricardo Gonzalez, that yeah. managed to get it spectacularly wrong going into turn 12 and sort of harpooned in to um, Heinemann Hansen. Nevertheless, later on, it was a right rear suspension failure on Olivier Pla's yeah. car. Now, they're taking pictures of that. It doesn't look as though it's going anywhere, does it? There seems to be concern over the safety of that car, yeah. and that's what it'll be. I think they wanted probably to get out just to run the last couple of laps, and the uh, technical people are saying, no. No. That would be exactly. my guess, yeah. You exactly. We can't, absolutely unfortunately, right. we can't hear what's going on, and uh, DR getting a little bit uh, orated there. So, yeah, I want to get out. You know, I want to just be seen at the finish, but uh, anyway. Well, it so, tends to be the way with scrutineers. Yeah. It's not a performance uh, check, that. That's just purely safety, and as with always the case, team members have one view, and the scrutineers have another view. Well, but then, yep. can't take any chances. We are in very quick machinery here and in the modern era and it's not an era that we like to see risk built into what these drivers are doing and so if there is any doubt it is the correct decision in my eyes. Yeah, Bertram Baguette then the unmistakable helmet and his uh, Terry Boutsen colours from uh, the days he was racing for Boutsen in World Series by Renault. Bertram 37 years old from Belgium and as Tom told us, the 2009 World Series by Renault champion. So, what's going to happen? There's the gap, 39.4 seconds. That's the gap to what? That's the gap between first and second, we guess. Now, if we'd been really diligent, we would have noted exactly how many pit stops the cars have done and exactly what lap they stopped. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't have access to the simulation software that the engineers will be rifling through at this stage in the race. They will know exactly 
what is going to play out in their minds, whether or not it happens on track, is a different kettle of fish. It's circumstantial. Anything can happen at any time, yep. lest we not forget. And you have to be reactionary in terms of your strategy. Yeah, and make no mistake about this, Toyota will be using their telemetry that's coming from the car to the pits. So they'll be sending that on to Cologne and Japan, and there'll be engineers pouring over that. The same with Audi. That'll be going back to Ingolstadt and they will be calling back the team saying, right, this is what we've worked out, this is what you need to do. So there's all this background going on, computers working over time, even in this last 35 minutes of the race. They'll all be doing that, same as in Formula One. Absolutely. Uh, there is so much data gathered from these cars and so much of that is trawled through. The, the chase for performance is really something special when you look at the environments that these technicians engineers and i call them whiz kids <laughs> work in because yeah. they really do they are number crunchers a lot more than that because they make it all happen the gap is coming down ever so slightly at the top and on board with the number two audi well, McNish will certainly have to make another stop. He can't run for another 35 minutes because it was 25 minutes ago he made a stop. Oh, there's the chrome car just getting in the way of him. And that Audi with that uh, twisted grin. I was going to say McNish with a twisted grin, but that, that front just, it's got a sort of sneer, hasn't it, about it, that Audi, since it had that tap in the front. A bit of a bop on the nose. That's, yeah. It's like a boxer after seven or eight rounds, doesn't it? But touch wood, we have had a very, very incident-free race moment basically a couple of cars as we know hitting the the track pyramids those uh, high high curbs high-rise curbs and uh, self-inflicted damage but uh, it has been a fairly clean race so far oh, really clean some great driving on show and we've only had one safety car it's right at the beginning and so that really is testimony to how well these drivers have performed under really testing circumstances incredibly hot here and heat really plays havoc with a driver it's their worst enemy and uh, your concentration starts to waver you fatigue and all kinds of uh, mistakes creep in when that is the case you need to be as fit as possible and these guys are anthony davidson alluded to it that the testimony to the toyota drivers how fit they are their ability to double stint they weren't scared of the heat he used the word scared it i remember when i was racing uh, when it's really hot you just think you know great because uh, ultimately you feel ill at the end of it. It's not a pleasurable experience because you know at the end of it you're going to be in a bit of a pickle. And we saw, or I saw, uh, Marcel Fasler and Andrea Lotterer. Audi have bought a, a Cars, the movie, paddling pool, and had it in the, in the paddock on the practice days. And the drivers were jumping out of the car, still in their Nomex, and getting in this paddling pool full of iced water uh, just to a try bunch and of, cool down. Just a bunch of kids. Exactly. <laughs> yes. A car's so, paddling pool as well. How, how so good is that? We did just see a graphic there telling us who the leaders were. It was uh, McNish, number two, Audi leading P1. P2 being led by Mike Conway still for G-Drive. And I guess Alan Docking will keep him in that car until the end of the race now. There's no point making a stop at this stage. GT Pro, that is led at this time by Jimmy Bruni. And both for AF Corsa cars, he and Kumai Kobayashi moving up very quietly into the lead of that class and then Aston Martin racing 1-2 Christian Poulsen from Jamie Campbell Water well we're into the final half hour just about five minutes time and uh, here we are riding with the number two Audi sport team Just entry the r8 which has uh, done such good service this year it has won everything this year including the sebring 12 hours which was not part of the championship but traditionally is used as a season warm-up and they just blitz the opposition there and that was with ollie jarvis sharing the car giving him his break he's been a long time audi tester he's driven for audi in the dtm and they gave him a chance to race at sebring and he repaid them with a, a victory there and that's something ollie will never forget no doubt you know him well tom Yes, I do. I uh, know him fairly well, anyway. <laughs> I, uh, I um, well, dri some some drivers, as we listen to the team radio, will uh, when I say nice things about them, they tend to be on, I tend to be on their Christmas list, and sometimes it's the other way around. That <laughs> is the G Drive car, the 25 car, spinning around 
Well, that yeah. Who is on board? James, James Walker. James Walker is on board that. That's we just a, saw the ending of yeah, that. Yeah, that's the sister car to the lead G Drive car, and uh, hopefully we'll see what happened with James. There uh, was he. Did you get involved with someone? In comes the number two car. Then this will be McNish's final pit stop because there's only 34 minutes of the race left. Will they put him on tires for sa new tires for safety, or are they happy to? take those Michelins to the end. It's tight, 37 seconds is the gap over the lead Toyota. I don't think they can afford to change tyres, uh, Tom. It's really tight. This is where all of their strategy will be played out right in front of our eyes. They will have calculated this. They haven't just stumbled across what they're going to do now. They would have had a really good idea from a couple of hours into this race as to exactly what's going to happen. The lap times that they would have had to have run in order to stay ahead of the Toyota and what the Toyota is going to do as well. And it doesn't look as though they're going to change tyres. I could be wrong. There are tyres out, but you just never quite know. That is the Toyota. But don't forget, the Toyota still needs to stop as well. So don't uh, jump for joy yet if you're a Toyota fan. And they're not stopping for tyres. Nope. So you're absolutely right. Now, Audi are going to double stint. And they've had to do that. All credit to Toyota. Toyota forced them into that. Yep. And this is the first time they've double stinted their yeah, tyres. Although, of course, effectively, it's going to be a one-and-a-half stint, isn't it, rather than a, a two, two full That's thing. That's why they've but taken the risk. But Nish has got to go for it, yeah. So let's see what the gap is in just a minute when they come out. We just mentioned Sebring, by the way, just to let it bring everyone up to date. The, this weekend at Austin, the um, International Motorsports Association, IMSA, have announced the 12-race schedule for the debut of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. This is the combined ALMS and uh, Grand Am series, and they will keep Daytona on the calendar. Sebring, Long Beach, Mazda, Inter uh, Laguna Seca, Detroit, Belle Isle, and there are 12 races in all, and it's a really, Some really strong program. on that calendar. Yeah, and what they're working towards, of course, is parity between LMP2 cars and the Grand Am prototypes. It's going to be quite difficult because Grand Am prototypes, for a start, have steel brakes. LMP2s have uh, carbon fibre brakes, and it's not just a question of changing a, a brake disc. It's a complete redesign of the whole car. A complete redesign. They're very different, aren't they? Yeah, but it's going to be really w worth watching that. So look forward to Daytona in January and Sebring particularly in March. And a lot of drivers in this series said they'd like to go to Daytona now and just get some winter racing experience okay, in. Well, I think Sebastian Buemi probably got the message with that, without that from uh, Hugh de Schonac, just telling him, you know, you've got to push, 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 push. What is the gap? Let's see, we haven't, hasn't come up yet. It's going to be all critical, that, because Toyota have got to do a splash and dash, basically. I think they can probably run for another four or five laps yet, but they've got 30 minutes to go. It all is dependent on the pace of Alan McMish, and I'm looking for my time screen to refresh. It has 24 seconds is the gap. That's yep. not enough to get out and back in front. So uh, Buemi's got to put his foot down. Mind you, no. they're not putting a fuel, a full fuel no. mode back on. That can't get that out <laughs> in the air. Full, full fuel mode? <laughs> yes. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> so. This is closer than I thought about half an hour ago. Yep. And that's why Luke Deval was looking or sounding a bit cagey, wasn't he, when we heard from him about 45 minutes ago. Right, we're on board at the moment with the 51 AF Corsa car, which has got the 71 car behind it. It's Jimmy Bruni uh, being followed by Kumai Kobayashi. But uh, Fred Makovicki leads at this moment. There he is. But he has got to make another stop. The two Ferraris have both had five stops and the Aston has only had four. So we know he is going to have to go in even just for a splash and dash. And it's so close. I mean, that, that is the gap. And further down, Aston Martin still 1-2 in GTM. It's uh, Christian Poulsen in the Danish Aston, the young driver's car from uh, Roland Gutter's uh, Gulf Aston Martin of Jamie Campbell Water and Stuart Hall. And it was Nicky Team that really did the damage, didn't he? Didn't yep. he in that class? Because Nicky Team managed to get past Jamie Campbell Water and just pulled away from Jamie before he handed over to Christian Poulsen. Yep. Real good stint 
from Nicky T. Yeah, oh, from all the guys there. And in third place, Raymond Narak is still there, but he has finally dropped off their lead lap. He is now one lap down on the two Aston Martins, such as their pace in GTE Am. And here it is. This is for second position. The two Ferraris, what they're ignoring is the car ahead of them, which is in first. I think that's the first place car, is it not? In no, the category? No, that. No, that's not the, not the. What, what 99. they're doing here is flashing uh, Jamie Campbell. Walter, oh, that's Jamie, yeah, not the 99 car. And Jamie does the right thing and gets out of their way. Because yeah. don't forget, these two port, uh, Ferraris are fighting an Aston Martin for the lead of this yeah. GTE Pro class. So he was just going to um, make life a little bit difficult for them. But he did he? the right thing because that would have been a bit political. But <laughs> that's why. Uh, Gianna Maria Bruni was flashing his lights because he could see the impending situation uh, yeah. no. unraveling in front of his eyes, but luckily it no. didn't happen. Well done, Jamie. That's good good driving there. And Jamie, of course, sharing that car with Stuart Hall. Done a good job again, both of them. They won in Sao Paulo. Uh, they're going to have a second place here if this is the situation that goes on. But we're still waiting for that lead Aston Martin, Fred Makovicki to make his stop in the 99 car, only four fuel stops to the five of the two Ferraris. And here's the Toyota, what's the, diff the gap now? That's... Uh... He's in, this is uh, the pit stop so that this... will make or break this race, Mark. 25.3 seconds, the gap between them. He's not gonna do a splash and dash in and out, is he? In that time, Christensen and Duval quite relaxed about it. I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> yeah, we all are. How long are they going to be at stop for the fuel? And it's not enough because there you go. Yep. That is the lead car or the lead Audi about to take the lead away from the Toyota. So, no, nah, nowhere near, no. I'm afraid. But having said that, so much closer well, than we thought it was going to be. Now, what's happening there? They've got a problem. They're not fueling it. They're, they're changing drink drink bottle but that costs some time i thought what you doing i understood you could change drink bottles and clean the screen while you were refueling that's the one thing you can do but obviously something else in there maybe rebooting. maybe they realized the lead had gone and they still needed to do what they needed to do to get the car to the finish yep. and ultimately they're fighting the yep. number one car and 25 minutes, that number two car could yet have a problem. Still got the length of a Formula Ford race to go. I didn't race for 25 minutes when I was in Formula Ford. It was about 14 minutes and four red flags in the middle oh, right. of that as well. And your race always finished after 14 minutes. None of them to do with me. In the gravel somewhere. Yeah, none of them to do with me, I can assure you that. <laughs> well, we're going to take another break uh, and we'll be back for that final. 25 minutes here at Austin. Been a fantastic afternoon racing. Beautiful, beautiful weather. And the shadows lengthening as we race into the setting sun here in Texas. It's that time of day. We're going through to the finish now. There are just um, some 23 minutes left and everything to play for. It's hotting up in all the classes, including the lead class. 30 seconds separating Audi and Toyota. And as Tom said earlier, who would have imagined that at the green flag? We've got great racing going on still in LMP2. We have got uh, three... Two, sorry, two Eureka Nissans and Lotus has now moved itself up into a podium place after James Walker had a spin in the Delta ADR. And I don't think Lotus would have expected that either. GT Pro, it's Aston Martin, still Fred Makovicki. But, Tom, we are expecting a pit stop from them. They've only done four against the five of the two Ferraris. But they've got a comfortable gap. It's around 59 seconds. So I think Makovicki can get in and out and make it count. It's whether or not he stays in the car. I'm pretty sure he will. Sarasan in the Toyota up front now. So Buemi did jump out. Did I miss that? Or was Sarasan already in it? Um, Sarasan's in it, yep. Yeah, he's in it. Yep. Um, they made they've the, just pitted. Uh, they made the change up. It's while we're off. Uh, and uh, Here's the two Ferraris then that 
done such a good job this afternoon. Can they carry the win, though? Would it be a 1-2 for AF Corsa? We'll have to wait and see in a minute. This is, of course, uh, the team that have already had two wins this year. They've had uh, two wins at Spa and Sao Paulo. That's with the Jimmy Bruni Giancarlo Fisichella car. The other car hasn't had the same success as that, but this would be win number three, and uh, no one else has that had that success this year. But can Fred Makovicki spoil the party for them by taking what would be his first win of the year? Uh, Aston only won once. Yeah, that's right. That, class. Yeah, that was at Silverstone with, when Senna was driving with uh, Mucha and uh, Darren Turner. It's probably not quite as warm as it is here back then at Silverstone. <laughs> Yeah, so, inherently quite cold in the UK at that time of the year. But uh, what a great uh, win it would be for Makovecki. As you said, Senna has won already this year with... Um, well, no, it's not Senna, Stefan Mucha, Darren Turner. Yeah. And it was Senna, he yeah, was with the third that, driver. At, yeah. at Silverstone, yeah. yeah. So, of course, what's happened today is that that car should have been shared with uh, Stefan and Darren by Oli Gavin. He didn't get in it because the car was broken before then. So he was racing in the ALMS yesterday, didn't finish. He was racing in the WEC today, didn't even start. So not a great weekend for our, our Oli. No, not a good weekend either. One to forget. I've had one more question through on Twitter. I said I would answer some if they came through. Luca Monroe. I'm not going to try and pronounce his middle name this time around. I've got it wrong. Would Sean Edwards and Michael Christensen be good in the Manthe GT Pro car in 2014? Both incredibly strong Porsche driver. Sean Edwards fighting for the Super Cup crown. Michael Christensen, a Porsche junior in the Super Cup. And yes, they would. Will they get the opportunity? Only time will tell. But definitely, Sean Edwards already making his mark in ALMS as well as Super Cup. So expect his name to move up the ranks, well, so to speak. Let me just add something to that. Uh, Porsche Motorsport boss Hartmut Christensen said this very morning, there's no decision yet on whether the mark will con Porsche will continue its factory participation in the WEC with the Manti racing team. So ah, we so don't know that yet. It may not Manti. be. It depends. Uh, they are offering customer versions of the 911 RSR, as we said earlier. But uh, yes, Sean Edwards, great. Not, not just... But not just the Super Cup, he has been outstanding again in the G ADAC GT Masters this year. He helped them get their first, Porsche's first win of the year in that two weeks ago at the Lausitz Ring. And Michael Christensen, teammate to Richie Stanaway in Super Cup, a, a race winner in the Super Cup this year. And we've seen what Stanaway's done in WEC this year in the Aston Martin. So Christensen more than capable of doing a good job as well. And sometimes Porsche do see factory drivers in customer uh, cars. We see that with Audi. Uh, Oli Jarvis is in the LMP1 car at Le Mans. He's racing in the Blanc Pain. Uh, this weekend at the Nürburgring with a customer. He was in Japan in midweek doing a tyre test with a customer. He, he's been here, there and everywhere, has Oli Jarvis. So he's never at Newmarket. No. Yeah. Anyway, well, just while we're talking about next year, let's just confirm also, not, not only the American calendar was confirmed today but at Austin, but also the 2014 calendar for the WEC, and it's going to be virtually identical to um, this year's. The only difference will be Bahrain will be bought forward two weeks earlier, so it's not such a big gap at the end of the year, because Bahrain won't be until the end of November this year. And Gerard Neveau, who's um, chief executive of the WEC, said we really have established the brand of the WEC in countries all around the world now, and he said what we're really looking forward to is the new LMP1 regulations and Porsche joining their, the challenge uh, with Audi and Toyota. One thing that came out we knew nothing about, he said that they'd had an ongoing financial situation with Spa, but apparently Spa has now reconsidered um, the offer that was made to run that race, and it looked like Nürburgring or Monza might have taken over from Spa, but Spa is going to be back on the calendar, which will be great relief to everyone because it is still everyone's favourite circuit. It's certainly one of my favourite circuits. As far as I'm concerned, if you're running a major championship, you have to have spa franc on the circuit <laughs> but, uh, calendar because it really is a magical place. And, you know, I've said 
I, I hope somewhere like the Circuit of Americas grows into that. A brand new venue, Herman Tilke Track, but nevertheless, a really great uh, circuit. Now, this is the battle for GTE Am. It's closed right up. Paulson, who took over from Nicky Team, has fallen into the clutches of Jamie Campbell Water, who's been in that car for what seems like an eternity. And with 16 minutes left on the clock, you'd be a brave man to bet against Jamie Campbell Water getting past Christian Paulson. They are teammates, so rule of thumb is do not risk anything and certainly no contact. But it looks as though Campbell Water's pace is definitely far superior to well, uh, Christian Paulson's at this stage yeah, well in the if, race. If Jamie in the 96 car could pull off the win today, that would uh, leap him and Stuart Hall into the lead of GTM because at the moment there are only two points behind uh, the championship leader, which is the IMSA Porsche, and then eight-star motorsports. So everything to play for here. There's still a long way to go in the season, though. Just to remind everyone, we've got three more races after this. Uh, the British Formula 3 has nearly come to an end. Grand Am's come to an end. But here, we're, this is only the first race of the second half of the season. It's such a strange uh, spread, isn't it, over the year, the WEC now? It's, uh, it, it certainly is. And... What a welcome return for the uh, AM driver within that Jamie Campbell Water Stewart <laughs> Hall setup as we see the second placed LMP2 car get right in oh, yeah. the midst there. The Pecon car has to be careful. Pierre Kaffer really uh, having to squeeze through the, uh, uh, the Aston Martin battle. There's waved flags here. What's happened? Oh. That is the AM Corvette. Yeah, oh dear, that's couple of times you've seen that face yeah, in the wrong direction. It's Fernando Reese again on board that car, the uh, Lava competition car, last year's championship winner. So, as we're saying about GTM, if Aston Martin can pull this off today, in fact, even if they finish second, they are going to move into the championship lead with three races still to go. GT Pro, Aston Martin came here leading that. If Fred Makovica can keep that up there, they'll go to Fuji, still in with the Aston Martin leading both GTE categories. Oak Racing came here leading in LMP2. Um, G-Drive wouldn't be able to make up that difference, but PCOM could just overhaul them to take the championship lead if they stay in that second place. And as far as the GT manufacturers is concerned, Ferrari would go further and further ahead in that championship. No contest between Audi and Toyota for LMP1. Toyota really struggling to get points. They got 67 against Audi's 128. I think they're coming second there, unfortunately for them. <laughs> but they have two cars yep. back in the mix when they head back to their homeland of Fuji. And that'll be really nice for the Japanese fans to see that. They'll have Nakajima back, won't they? And, yep. Uh, Lapierre, is it Lapierre? And yeah, that'll be really, really good. And it's, it's a circuit that really lends itself to, to endurance racing. Oh, and this uh, is getting so tight. Jamie's just got bored and the uh, just starting to think, right, I'm going to go through as soon as I can. So David Richards <laughs> has probably turned his attention from one headache of trying to get the championship leading Darren Turner Aston back on track to his next headache, and that is managing how these two finish the final 13 minutes. And that is Mike Conway in the lead LMP2 class car. Just listening to uh, yeah, th Team Radio. 32 seconds, they're saying the gap. It was 34, and uh, Sarazan's brought it down by another two seconds over the last couple of laps. But I think with only uh, just, what, 12 minutes, le 13 minutes left to run, Alan is looking pretty safe at the moment for what would be his third win of the year. This is where the interest is. We, it might be into factory racing, into, into Mark racing, the two Astons, but they're putting on a great show here this afternoon. There we are. That's the split every lap. It comes and goes. It's like a concertina, isn't it? Uh, or an accordion, yeah. Very, very close is this gap now. And uh, nail-biting stuff for the teams involved.
So just 12 and a half minutes left to go here at Austin. It's been a six hour race. It's been a very, very interesting race. Fascinating for everyone. The drivers particularly who've all just fallen in love with this beautiful five and a half kilometer facility outside the state capital, Austin. And of course, Formula One will be back here in November again for the second time. It's Lewis Hamilton who won here last year. Can he repeat that? Or will Sebastian Vettel be long crown champion? We'll find out when we get to the end of November. Here's the Sarazan and Fasler. This is the uh, number one car, the one that's had all the trouble today, hooking himself back onto the tail of uh, Sarazan. Oh, and we've got a mark pass, have we? Is that Jamie? Oh, big smoky moment for both of them there. I think they both outbroked each other. Yeah, as <laughs> you were, boys, because that is not the way to go racing in the final stages. But nevertheless, Jamie Campbell-Walter is ahead of Christian Paulson. So or, in or, that, or, or is he? Yeah, he is. He is. He is Here we he go. Is. There it is again. So they, they outbraked each other, didn't they? <laughs> Both had huge smoky moments. Went far too fast into that corner. Well, well, Christian Paulson put off by Jamie Campbell Water. <laughs> Jamie Campbell Water not alongside. A little bit naughty, but uh, in terms of the team environment. But uh, nevertheless, Christian Paulson. Uh, managed to avoid contact by outbreaking himself and Jamie Campbell Water just inherited the empty track that was available <laughs> to him so yeah. that sorted itself out and I don't think Christian Paulson's got enough to come back 10 minutes left on the clock here and this is the battle for second position and that Porsche is recovering that is not in the mix. No, but we're all waiting to see what uh, Fred Makovic is going to do in the Aston. Is he going to get to the end of the final 10 minutes in that number 99 car that's been leading for the last hour and a half? Well, we'll know, won't we? Look at the shadows now really lengthening here across the uh, Texas prairies. Beautiful time of year here in Texas, really, really warm, but come back here in about two months' time and you get what are called the blue northers, these uh, icy cold winds that come down from the north and just freeze everything. Just a quick hello to the Branders, Donna and uh, Michael Brander, who I hope are watching, and Donna comes from Austin, it's her hometown. They now live in Scotland and uh, so let's say hello to them. Here we have another moment. It's the Toyota letting the number one yep. Audi pass. Yes. No need to fight that nope. car. It's um, unnapping itself, isn't it? Yep. It's, it's no danger to the uh, Toyota's position. It's one lap behind both of them. So at least we can have all three top three cars finishing, hopefully on the same lap, which will be. Uh, well, no, he's got. Of course, he's got to catch the other other Audi to do that. What's Jamie saying there? That wasn't Jamie, that's the 99 car, isn't it? The 99 Fred, car. Fred Makovicki. Just uh, getting on top of how many laps yeah. were left and no. what the gap was. This so is... That, yeah, that would have been John Gore uh, from Aston Martin then telling Fred exactly where they were. So obviously there's no plan to call him in. So what's the gap? That is... Uh, Fred is now 24 seconds ahead of these two cars. And they haven't uh, changed. Yep. Patrick Pillay ahead of them, recovering. He's passed yep. and gone through the middle of these two Ferraris. That was the car we saw on fire yeah. <laughs> a couple of hours ago. A test session for them, effectively, using Patrick Pillay's words. And uh, formation finish for the two AF Corsa cars. Still pushing hard, but I don't think they've got enough pace to catch Makovecki in these closing uh, minutes of this six hour of the Circuit of Americas. What a great race we've had. And Toyota surprising themselves, surprising us, really in the mix and pushing that lead Audi hard. And they've had to work for their race win. And uh, having to work hard early on was Marcel Fazler, and that is why they're behind the Toyota, because they couldn't get past 
and then they got a bit urgent. It went wrong <laughs> for the uh, number one car, and they've paid the price, haven't they? Spent the yep. whole race trying to catch up. Yeah, but just, the Toyota is too fast. Yep, we just saw a nice shot of uh, Tom Christensen, like Duval, just discussing uh, how they're going to celebrate tonight. And standing right behind them in the cap was uh, Dindo Capello, who, although he's officially retired from WEC racing, is still carving his motorsport career in Italian uh, supercar racing and enjoying every moment of it in the V8 saloons there, driving, of course, for Audi. So just a few minutes left on the clock. Alan McNish knows how critical this is just not to make any mistakes in these closing moments and to be particularly aware of the, the sun as you come over the brows, as we mentioned earlier. Here we are, 35 seconds, the gap now, so Alan is either extending it a little bit or, oh, in fact, Sarazan was two seconds quicker on that last lap. Well, they're managing the gap now and it, it yeah. will fluctuate because of traffic and the circumstances that uh, the cars find themselves in in terms of yeah. passing slower cars. Look, uh, Alan McNish, certainly no need to push any harder than he's pushing now. And this man has got the legs over Marcel Fazler, who's in third place as well. Yeah. McNish ooh, <laughs> right up behind the, oh, was the 88 Proton competition car. Yeah. He's in that, I can't see. Have to scroll down my timing screen. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'm, I'm on the ball here. Well, I was on the ball here. The 88 is uh, Christian Reed at the moment. He's been in that car for the last uh, hour and a half. So the number one car, funnily enough, in third place, the one we just saw uh, Sarazan let go by, he is fastest car on the track at the moment. He's just popped in a 49.7 uh, on his last lap. Not that it's going to get him any further up the order because uh, he will forever be one lap behind this car. Five minutes left to go then. And uh, again, not seeing very much of the rebellion Lola Coupe, Toyota powered, same engine that the factory Toyota uses, that 4.5 litre, 4 litre V8, but of course without the hybrid uh, systems and curves, etc. So here we go then, Alan just uh, picking off these last few laps, and just as we say it, there it is, the number 12 car at the moment in the hands of Nico Prost, Alain Prost's son. Just like that, on demand, <laughs> such is the power that you hold, Mark Holt. <laughs> that is it. Just uh, there we go, on demand, the rebellion as we see it. Nico Prost on board the rebellion in fourth place. Driven a very good race, have all the drivers in this car and it has been very quick indeed. Hasn't quite been quick enough to challenge the Audi in front of it. The number one car has had its problems, but the Rebellion hasn't been able to capitalize and you wouldn't expect it to. Nevertheless, it has done a very good job and it's a shame it's kind of lost its sparring partner in Stracker, as we alluded to earlier. Um, because they would have had a real great race. We're on board with the race leader as his teammates look on. The clock counts down here in Austin, Texas. Three minutes and 36 seconds to go. And the gap to second place is 33 seconds. Mike Conway is leading in the LMP2 class, the G-Drive Racing Orica is one minute and 42 seconds ahead of Pierre Kaffer, who's in second place. Then it is Makovecki in the GTE Pro, Aston Martin that is leading the two AF Corsa cars. That is the closest battle in all the classes, 23 seconds separating the top three. But importantly for Makovecki and Aston Martin, it's 20 seconds between him and Gianna Maria Bruni in second. Then Jamie Campbell-Water, we saw that move for the lead over his teammate, Christian Poulsen. Uh, he's pulled out a gap of 1.6 seconds now in GTE Am. So that is very, very <laughs> close indeed, but I can't see Poulsen 
coming back, but we'll have to wait and see. Still, with two minutes left, anything can happen. I keep saying it. Yep. Don't tempt fate. Well, <laughs> so two seconds a lap quicker at the moment. Sarazan in the Toyota. Not that it's going to make a difference because that gap is still around the 32, 33 second mark. Here is the third place car. Marcel Fasser on board. Nico Pross, fourth for Rebellion. And then Mike Conway in fifth place overall for G-Drive, leading LMP2. Great afternoon for him. And that'll be back-to-back -back wins after Sao Paulo for the man who's had two IndyCar wins as well as... Uh, making his name in sports car racing. Big vibration there on the number one car. They, yeah. they did uh, report that from very early on in the race. Marcel Fazler, the first driver in that car, and it's had that vibration ever since. I don't suppose... Stint. Yeah, I doubt if the front suspension is uh, in a great alignment, is it? They'll have to sort that out between now and Fuji. Well, I hope none of the drivers have any fillings because they might not still be in their teeth by the end yeah. of this race. So probably the last lap. It is the final lap as he comes out of the shadow of the main grandstand on the pit straight. Big gaggle of cars at the top of the hill and Alan just uh, threading the needle as he... Well, just back off a little bit, Alan. Don't get yourself put out of the race at this stage because you have to finish these races, unlike in IMSA. If you don't take the chequered flag, you are not classified. There's the Oak Racing art car. And uh, the car is going to make the finish too. It's a great onboard shot. And just look at this, some of these blind brows, Tom. You know, you, just, you must wonder where you are from time to time. Well, they're long corners. You spend a lot of time in those meandering corners. Turns three down to turn eight and nine. And you're constantly chasing the throttle, working with the slip angle of the front tyres. And it is a real marvel. If you can get through there quickly, you've done a good job. Now on to the 1.1 kilometre back straight. And Luke Deval <laughs> getting ready yeah. to take the plaudits. Yeah, he's not going to attempt fate. He's, he knows that they're there into the final corner then. Alan McNish heading for his third season win. This will be after that win at Le Mans, an absolutely fantastic win. And also at home for him at Silverstone with Tom Christensen and Ruak Duval as he comes into the final couple of corners out of turn 20, past the pit lane entrance and then onto the pit straight. And he will take the chequered flag as he comes out of the next two corners. A faultless drive it has been by Alan McNish, Loic Deval, and Tom Christensen. They've really deserved it because, together with their crew, they've been absolutely faultless the whole of this six hours. Checker flags waiting. Daniel Petra, the uh, race director of the World Endurance Championship gives the flag. Well done, Tom. Well done, Luak. And uh, well done, Audi. Martin Pass there. Audi's uh, press officer patting uh, Luak on the back. Alan McNish then delighted. Let's see if we can uh, get on board radio. There's the number one car. Incidentally, the number one car in the hands of Marcel Fassler. Fastest lap of the race, 147.3. So they've, picked, they've come home with something as well as a podium finish and more points. But McNish and Duval and Christensen go even further ahead in the championship. I think that was Benoit Trillier that set that fastest lap, wasn't it? It might have been Fazla. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, yeah, it's, it's that, the right car. It's that car, yeah. And there's uh, Andre Lotterer just being congratulated on their podium finish. But let's not forget, Toyota put on a great show to gain against Audi. Only one Toyota, remember, against two Audis, which is always going to be a handicap. They'll have two in Fuji, though, next race. And the Aston Martin Racing flags wave because they have done the double. They've won the GTE Pro Class. Makaveki crossing the line ahead of Gianna Maria Bruni and Kamu Kobayashi. And in the LM GTE class is Jamie Campbell Walter ahead of Christian Paulson and Norak in the IMSA performance Matmut 911 GT3 RSR. So a very good day in the office well, for Aston Martin. That's right. Apart from Darren <laughs> Turner leading the yeah. championship and not finishing. But to take two wins and a podium um, in the GT classes against Ferrari, against the factory Porsche team, 
David Richards should be mighty pleased of himself and uh, with his boys. What a great job they've all done, not just the drivers, but the whole of the crews under John Gore. And of course, not to forget the young drivers, Aston Martin team under Jan Struve. So here we go, there's the Eureka winner. It's your pal, Mike Conway, together with uh, John Martin and uh, Roman Rusinov. Well done, Mike, back-to-back -back wins for that team. Alan Docking, who's uh, really, really put a lot of heart and soul into this team this year. Great help from Nissan, great help from G-Drive, and uh, officially the sort of factory supported teams in the WEC this year. But what will Nissan be doing next year? Alan hopes it will become full-on factory. Just looking forward to that. Well, back-to-back -back pole positions for that G-Drive racing car and back-to-back -back wins. They're certainly on a march, aren't yep. they, in that LMP2 class? Excellent. So in comes our race winner, Alan Mutnish, just savouring this moment. Remember, it's the first ever World Endurance Championship win in America. For anyone who haven't had the Endurance Championship, we've had World Sports Car Championship in the past at Watkins Glen, Mo Sport, and... Uh, of course, at Daytona in the in the dim and distant past, but the World Endurance first time here, an inspired choice by the ACO to bring it to Austin. It's just the most modern, up-to-date facility in the world at the moment, probably, and attract all the drivers without exception. Say so they loved. It's an absolutely brilliant venue, and I think we'll be coming back <laughs> as you say. And that is what it means to Alan McNish to win here this afternoon the six hours of the circuit of the americas what a great job everybody here in austin texas has done they put on a real show for the fia wec yep. and in turn the drivers have repaid that faith and delivered a really great race what a job from all at audi what a job from all at Toyota. Come on, yeah. Alan, kiss the cowgirl. We want to see it. Yeah, the cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> Yeehaw! I wonder if they get Stetsons yep. uh, on the podium. That's what oh, happened. There we, <laughs> there we go. He couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could see that right one coming. Right on cue again. <laughs> I could see that one coming. And here we are, Fred McAvicki. What a great drive by him and Bruno Senna. That is a, a big makeup, isn't it, for their disappointment in. Uh, Sao Paulo at Brazil, Bruno Senna's hometown when they were leading and they had uh, suspension damage when uh, well, when Bruno was showing with Rob Bell. And here's the winner of LMP2, Mike Conway. What a good afternoon for him and his co-drivers in that number 26 car run by Alan Docking, Roman Rusinov and uh, John Martin. Alan McNish, they didn't make it easy for you, but you got there. Uh, they actually were a big surprise, to be honest with you. They could double stint the tyre at the beginning when we couldn't. That meant there's a 25 second per stint loss for us in that respect. So we had to wait until the end before we could actually achieve the same thing. But the car was faultless. It ran really well. The guys set it up extremely well, considering we had such a lack of practice time. And I'm very, very pleased. Not bad for an old man. No. <laughs> Anna McNish with the sweat pouring off his brow. Yeah, but just shows how hard he's had to work because it was really hot out there this afternoon. Temperatures in the mid 35 yeah. centigrade region, and that's hot inside the car. Well, let's just remind you what happened here this afternoon in Texas. It was an Audi 1 2 on the grid, but Toyota wanted to muscle in on the party, did all it could using its uh, earlier available hybrid power, tried to go around the outside of the second place Audi couldn't, but behind them, James Ross had to spat out the pack, and it's the end of the 31 Lotuses race just on the first turn. How sad is that, Tom? Oh, I cannot believe they've come all of this way and neither can they to be out in turn one. And almost out on the spot was Marcel Fazda leapfrogging across one of the big sausage curves at the beginning of the first sector. This was the Team Manthe Porsche AG Racing uh, car on fire in the pit. But back to the action, Christensen putting a move on Sarasan 
and this was right in the mix of when Toyota were double stinting their tyres and really putting this car under pressure. Loic Deval would get in and catch back that advantage. Such was his pace and he would eventually pass Stefan Sarazan. And the recovering number one car heading up to turn one, getting back ahead of the rebellion that did hold that third position for ever so, well, for a short period of time, I should say. Yep. Then we saw about Duval eventually catching Sarazen. Sarazen again giving the space to get by, then tacking on to the back of him, just as he did Christensen. And that really is what gave Toyota that second place this afternoon. They were racing themselves rather than Audi at that point, but they just knew the pace they had to keep up. They kept to it. They meant their tyres were protected, the drivers were protected, and it's given them a very, very good second place. Remember, 23 seconds at the end of the race. So well done, Toyota, and that number eight car. Can they do better in Japan when they're running two cars on their home track? Well, this, well, this was, as I turn my microphone on, Trellier getting it wrong. We don't normally see Audi drivers locking the rears in fairly elementary braking zones. Was it a problem with his curves? We don't know, or his brake balance. Olivier Pla, broken rear suspension and did well to keep it out of the barriers and the GTE car in front of him. Was that a legacy of the Oak Racing contact? We yeah. don't know. Alan McNish then gets in for the final two hours of the race and he sets off chasing after Sarazan who then hands the car having had an hour with Anthony Davis on board to Sebastian Buini. Uh, but it's not enough, and even with Sarazan back on board, Alan McNish can take the win for Audi for the third time this year after Silverstone and Le Mans with Tom Christensen and Luak Duval. Well, this is always the interesting moment. Let's hope we can catch some snatches of conversation as the Toyota and Audi guys all uh, swap notes. It's organised chaos in the yeah. room. That way? No, go back before <laughs> we receive the drivers on the podium. Yeah, it's uh, LMP2 first they do, so... Uh, that's Rebellion, so they get the privateer award, the only privateer, but you have to finish to get that, and uh, a good job they did, a solid fourth place, and uh, um, not so far behind, four laps down after 187 laps and six hours. Really good pace from yep. these guys and definitely the unsung heroes. Didn't see much of them, but they have worked hard in the heat and probably outperformed themselves, yep. really, as we've talked about how strong Toyota were. I think Rebellion, really strong as well, but not quite strong enough to are they get gonna, ahead. Are they going to get the hats? That's what we want to know. <laughs> yeah, so. well, we, we saw it in Formula One last year. All right. It'd be great to see it back, wouldn't we? Third place Audi team then. That is uh, Marcel Fassler, together with Andre Lotterer and Benoit Trillier. Two times Le Mans winners, but not this year. I'll tell you what, there have been an awful lot of Stetsons if you were oh, to yeah. give Aunt them Davis, out on the podium. Ant Davis and Sebastian Buemi and Stefan Sarazan in second place. A great second place for Toyota. They can build on that now. They know they've got the reliability. A perfect race and not a single problem. And here's the winners, Christensen, Duval, and we, Alan McNish. Full of energy still. Oh, yeah. So fit are these drivers here today. <laughs> Alan McNish has trodden yeah. on Anthony Davis's trophy. How kind of him. <laughs>
you've enjoyed this afternoon's race. There's plenty more on Eurosport. We're back at Fuji, Japan on the 20th of October, then Shanghai on the 10th of November, the season finish in Bahrain on the 30th of November. Quite a late end to the season, but as we said, that would be bought for two weeks next year. So really exciting year to look forward to. All these guys here on the podium, plus Porsche, fighting for outright victory. That's uh, a nail-biting thought, isn't it? So the uh, trophy is being handed out. It's Rolex watches in the uh, ALMS. It's Tudor watches here. This is the every driver proud to have that. And Tudor, of course, sponsors of the. United Sports Car Series in America next year. So that's a, a big name taking that mantle over from Rolex. Sounds like there's a jet plane taking off in the background, <laughs> yeah. doesn't there? President Probably of the track sweepers they've got here. So Pierre Fillon there just handing out the trophies. President of the ACO. And of course, brother of the former Prime Minister of France, Francois Fillon. Pierre taking such an active interest in... Uh, Developing the World Endurance Championship. Dedicated racer himself. They've worked hard yeah. for those three trophies. And what does the flame signify? Do they fracking in uh, Texas? Exactly. I'm just <laughs> you know you read my mind. <laughs> Excellent. Well, they're certainly different trophies, aren't they? Those, those are ones they'll uh, enjoy having in the place. Hello, guys. Very novel. Let's wait for the champagne to start bubbling over. We need Bob Constantinus now, the famous words. And now, and the champagne. Of the six <laughs> there, it's all going <laughs> off now on the podium. Yeah. Well, they'll be back. The date's fixed already for next year, and I'm sure everyone will be looking forward to coming here. But uh, as we say...